have come and we have found life everlasting. Now alive to know your freedom, never ending. You alone have made a way for us in your Great. 
in heaven so let it be Hey City Church, welcome to November. Unbelievable. The year has been challenging and yet it has flown by so fast and now we enter into the second to the last month of the year. And as a church, we've from the very start believed that the end of the year, we will end it strong and we'll end it blessed, okay? So I wanna thank you today for uh, just being with us. I also wanna thank uh, everybody that watches regularly we see your names all the time you make the comments we want to tell you we really appreciate you for doing that there are people even from different parts of the country and even around the world you've been so consistent so we commend you we thank you for that i want to thank also all the volunteers especially those with in tune the worship team and uh our production especially our, our you know the people behind the scenes all the time and, and doing all the editing, doing all the camera work, doing all the mix downs. We appreciate you. None of this could have happened without you. And so it's an unusual time, an unusual season for the church where we're all online. One of these days we're believing to get back together soon. So look forward to that. Keep praying for that. I wanna thank also all of you who share, who like, who invite your friends and especially those as, as well that have, have supported us financially in the giving. None of this could have also happened without silent givers, and we appreciate what a giving people you are. City Church, you're one of the most generous churches I've ever known, and we commend you for that. You are blessed, and that's why you're such a blessing. And thank you for being so good in giving to the Lord's work. But then also last week, we had Dr. Russell McKeeling. What an amazing message that was, just blending in all the wisdom that she's had in experiences, especially founded in the Word of God. Dr. Russell, we really appreciate you. Thank you. It challenged us. It changed us. It gave us a gauge of our own mental health. And we appreciate for you for that. In fact, every church needs a Dr. Russell um, in their in their ministry as well, because she balances us out so much. And oftentimes, uh, as ministers, our head is our head and our hearts are way up in heaven. We're not touching earth enough. And she puts a reality check on all of us. And so we thank you. Also, for everybody that shares throughout the week in the different midweek services we have from Wednesdays to the young adults, to our Bible studies on Thursdays, Fridays with the youth, children on Saturdays, and then for Sundays as well. The various speakers that sacrifice and give to this, we appreciate all of you as well. And so today, um, I wanna look at, of course, a review from what was last week. We talked about the parable of the 10 virgins, and the focus was, of course, on the five that were foolish because they missed the wedding. And we said it's so important that, that when they begged for oil because their amps, lamps were empty, that you and I need to realize there is oil that can be borrowed and there's oil you need to generate for yourselves. And so when we come together as a congregation or even at a time like this, we're actually pouring oil into each other's lamps. We are blessed by you, you're blessed by whoever is ministering. And so as a church congregation, when we used to come together, what would happen is we would pour oil into each other's lamps. But then we said there's oil that you can't give away. There's oil that's really just generated by you in the spirit and for you. And that's where your sacrifices and your praise unto God and your prayers, uh, these are things you need to generate yourselves. And so we can't just say, you know what, why don't you just sleep, we'll do all the praying. Or why don't you just not read the Bible, we'll read the Bible for you. No, there's a benefit when we do the devotionals ourselves. And so we said that our primary dependence is not on the church, though we need each other, but our primary dependence is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can't substitute being busy 
serving in church or doing church, we cannot substitute that with an oil that comes from our relationship with the Lord, okay? And so I want to examine today our relationship with the Lord. I want to examine the depth and genuineness of our Christianity. Are we really changing? Are we just saying we're Christians? Did we just change church affiliation, but not really have a real change from within? I want us to examine today just our progress, even through this year, uh, in our Christianity. We are born again of the Spirit. We're not just slapping on a type of Christianity. We're changed and transformed. In fact, the Bible tells us, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. And so I want to look at that. Have old things really passed away? Have we truly changed? Or is our change cosmetic? Is it something that we're just doing new rituals, doing new traditions? Uh, because I'm perplexed at how many Christians say they've surrendered their lives to Christ, say they have changed, and then they unchange and go back into the attractiveness of the world that they came from. We don't know why. We don't know is it they got used to the novelty of church and it no longer tickled them? Or is it because they were now drawn and attracted again to the ways of this world? Maybe they were relying on oil from others. Maybe they weren't really rooted. Maybe they just went back. Uh, maybe they just showed uh, a change on the outward but not real change happened within. Can we say this, that the proof of our Christianity is not the busyness of our work in the ministry, but it's proven by the fruit that we produce from a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Fruit you can't fake. And today I want, I want us to examine that, and I want you to turn your Bibles with us. 2 Kings chapter 6, a passage that we've shared several times in Tuesday prayer, and then sometimes on Sunday. And the reason why sometimes messages become repeated uh, is not because we're, we're taking an old message and sharing it to you again, but there's a freshness from the same scriptures uh, that we want to share with you. And I'd like to entitle today this message, Lay the Axe to the Root. Remember, we're examining change. Lay the Axe to the Root. And we come in prayer to you, Father, and we thank you so much for your goodness. Your grace has sustained us, even throughout this challenging year as we enter into November. We thank you that your grace continues to abound. Your love is always there, and your mercy is always with us. We thank you for your goodness in our lives. We call November blessed, Lord. We thank you that we prepare ourselves and examine ourselves between now and the end of the year. The greatest change in our lives throughout this year will happen. And I believe even throughout this challenging year, Lord God, this church and your church, your people, have risen to the challenge to face it because we are confident in you that in all things we are more than conquerors and we are overcomers in Christ. Let your word be a blessing to everyone that listens, God. Arrest their attention, every distraction right now, and cause them to open, the, to open their hearts, to open their minds in Christ Jesus. Cause them to change. Lord, we don't want to talk Christ in church. We want change, a real Christianity with Christ in the church. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm at 2 Kings chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 1. Listen carefully to this. It's on the screen for you to help you out as well. Verse 1 says, And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan. And let every man take a beam and there, or, or your version might say a log from there. Let us make there a place where we can dwell. And so he answered, Go. Verse 3. Then one said, please consent to go with your servants or come with us. And he said, I will go. Verse four, he said, I, and so he went with them. And when they came to the Jordan, 
they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. And so he cut off a stick, and he threw it there, and he made the iron float. And therefore he said, Pick it up for yourself. And so he reached out in his hand, with his hand, and he took it. Thank you, Lord, for the anointing of your word for all of us to receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're entitling this, Lay the Axe to the Root. Watch the setting first. Watch where we're going with this. By the time we end with this, we want to make sure that you and I can examine ourselves and recognize whether we're just layering Christianity over old foundation, whether we have carelessly not laid the axe to the root and tried to build our Christianity on it. We want to be able to question and examine ourselves. But watch how this setting is. First of all, it said in verse 1 and 2 that the sons of the prophets, these are good people, the prophets of Elisha, said, See to him, the place where we dwell with you is too small. In other words, there was growth. There was progress. And that can happen sometimes in our Christian walk. It can happen in a church wherein we're growing and now we have to build bigger. In fact, we just left an old center and now we've started a new center. We've made a better center. And somehow we were growing in all of that. But watch what happens with the challenge of growth. They realize, it said there in verse 1, that the place is too small for us. So they expanded. Like I said, the setting is progress. The setting is growth. Okay, And then they, the request was in verse 2. They came up with a building plan. They said, you know what? Let's all go to the Jordan. Let's chop down some trees. Everybody brings a log with them. And let's build a bigger place. Good intention. Many good intentions also have big challenges. And so they all went there. But then here's what they said. Can the man of God please come with us? And Elisha said, sure, I'll go with you. And it's a good thing. And so they built, they went down to chop down the trees. And I want us to look at just verse by verse really quickly how this went out. It said there, the story goes on, that as they were chopping trees, one of the people that was, was chopping, his axe head fell off. Now I want you to imagine a man together with others chopping trees down, the iron axe head falls off into the Jordan River. And of course, he's now bothered by that because it wasn't his. It was just borrowed. And the story went that as, as he cried out, alas, you know, master, I lost the, the iron axe head because it was borrowed. The man of God or Elisha said, where did it fall? He pointed to the place and Elisha broke off a stick, threw it in the water and the iron axe head floated and the man of God, or Elisha, said, go pick it up yourself. That's simply the story. I want to take that story, and I want us to see how we can examine ourselves, whether change in our Christianity has really happened, or are we just saying we're Christians, going to church, doing church, and now that we can't do church, a lot of Christians were exposed that they didn't have oil for their own lamps, why? I want to present to you today <clears throat> that perhaps there were roots to their old lives that were not severed. And you can't cut roots unless you have an axe. And so here's how it goes. It says there in, first of all, I want you to look at this, okay? I want you to look whether you're a growing Christian. They were growing. I want you to look whether your heart is expanding for the Lord. I want us to look between now and the end of the year. What can we do to bring lasting change in our lives? How many Christians change than unchange? I want us to look at the issues of perhaps our old life that seems to keep sprouting back, okay? And I want us to be able to, to follow just the scripture and see where can we go from here? We want to grow but something happened that stopped the growth. A man lost his axe head. And with that, he can't continue the work of chopping. 
Okay, number one, I want us to look at this. Lay the axe to the root. Number one, sharpen your axe. In a scripture, Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 10, reads like this. If the axe is dull and one does not sharpen the edge, then he must use more strength. But wisdom brings success. It actually implies, hey, be sharp here, be wise here so that you don't have to use so much effort. And that's common sense right there. Verse 5 goes like this, okay? It says there, As one was cutting the tree, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, and he said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed, okay? Alas, uh, not a term we commonly use. It's an old English term, uh, Another version says, oh, no, you know, uh, in Cebu, we might say, ayay, or patay, it was just borrowed. How many of you know, borrowed things aren't cared for as much as when it's your own? You know, when somebody borrows something you have, well, if they honor you for the first few times, maybe they'll take care of it. But if they keep borrowing things from you, how many of you know, how many of you know when things are borrowed, it's not taken care of as well as if it's the owner using it. Case in point, real common in many churches. We try to avoid that in city church. Church instruments, the musicians. I've watched musicians in the past when they bring their own guitars and after they, they, they play it, they have a rag, a cloth, and they wipe their guitar head. They wipe it down before they pack it all up because... It's theirs. And then I've seen people use church guitars and they just use it and just leave it there. Why? It's not theirs. And the premise I'm trying to establish to you is borrowed things are usually not taken care of as well as things that are your own. Okay? Oil that is borrowed isn't valued as much as oil that you worked for. And... Um, when you look at, into things like this, when, when money is borrowed, it's different from when money is earned. And so when something is borrowed, it's not taken care of as well. Sharpen your axe. That's a good thing to do. If you, with your own axe, you borrow it, you, you, you sharpen it. But if you borrow somebody, axes, somebody else's axe, I pray that you sharpen that too. Well, this first case... Sharpen your axe. Remember, we're trying to chop something down. Okay, why? So that we can build from it. So it says there, alas, it was just borrowed. And when you come to realize this, years ago when we started our building our first center, because we're now in our third center, our, our office. The first time we built our first center, I remember we were borrowing, we borrowed somebody's drill. And because we overused it, we abused it, it burnt out. And so we borrowed somebody else's drill and it burnt out too. And we were on our third drill and it was starting to fail. And at, by the time we finished, we had to buy three new drills to give to the people we borrowed from, okay? And that's why, that's, that's alas right there. And so we now have a no borrowing policy in, in the office as much as possible, we don't want to borrow things. We rent or we buy, but we don't borrow, okay? First thing I want us to look at, to measure our change and whether, whether we can keep growing, sharpen your ax. Number two, I want to work from there. Know the feel when things are loose. Certainly, when this man was chopping with his ax, Certainly, through different wax at the tree, he must have felt there was something different. You see, when it's not yours, you're not, you're not used to its feel. You can't really tell. See, some of you drive cars, and when you're driving a car, you know your car. You know when something's, uh-oh, something's not, not right here. It doesn't feel like it used to feel. But when you borrow somebody's car, you don't know what's, what the condition uh, you have no history of its condition. You just come drive it and compare it to what you have. 
but you don't have a reference. Know the feel when things are loose in your own life. Gotta know the feel when, hmm, my marriage is a bit loose. It's gonna fall apart soon. Know when something isn't working in tip-top shape, okay? And routine has a way of making us take things for granted. And sometimes when we do church, go to church, set up for church, counsel, meet, you know, worship, pray, the routine of that can sometimes catch us unaware and we're not realizing it's not there anymore. I mean, we see that many times with people who, are, who, who have surrendered their lives for the Lord, tears flowing down their eyes, and, and, and there's just an excitement about church again. There's just, they want to come to church. They wish they could do church every day, okay? But somewhere along the way, things get loose. And sometimes people say, remember our first love? You might, could we go back to that reference? We have people that are new in the Lord or new with City Church. They're so excited with City Church. They're always typing and commenting, you know, giving us messages because you can see that excitement and we draw strength and oil from that and say, you know what, I remember when we were like that. And the good question to ask is, where did we lose it? Why aren't we as sharp as we used to be? You remember the time when things were so sharp? You know, you're up early, get ready for serving God. Remember there was that excitement and that zeal and somehow along the way, the act started to get dull and you, you still had to do what you had to do, but now there's more effort because it's not cutting like it used to. And then somewhere along the way, it fell off. Lots of Christians have fallen off. This year, with a lockdown, a lot of Christians realized their acts was just borrowed. They, their axe wasn't sharp. And they were really putting an effort into ministry. And many were saying, you know what? We're tired. Tired. Can you imagine being on lockdown, staying at home and getting tired? You know, we've never been more rested than any other year. This is the most rested year for most of us. And yet many Christians are saying, can I take a break? Can I rest? I'm tired. You know why, why that was probably happening? Because perhaps the X was dull. Perhaps there's just so much physical effort to try to do a spiritual thing. You will get tired, as I would, when I'm trying to use my own strength to do God's work. You can't do God's work with human strength. We've got to do God's work with God's strength. And the only way to do that is to have him so full in us that whatever we were doing, by his grace, we're able to do it, not by might, nor by power, but by his spirit. And so, feel yourself. Am I kind of getting loose with, am I dried up reading this? Do I not feel like it anymore? Have I lost, you know, the iron axe head that used to be my tool to be able to minister, you know, have I found a dullness in this already? Do I not have an excitement for new Christian songs that come about? Or do I have lost, have I lost the excitement of sharing uh, the gospel to somebody else and seeing their lives change? And I love it when people's lives are changed. I love it when people say, write us and tell, you know what, this is what God did through the ministry, through the word, through the worship. And it excites us and it, it somehow sharpens our ax head. But we can get through work and ministry and routine dull. And it's important that we check ourselves. Have we become dull? Whenever we get somebody come, let's say, on staff, you will see their diligence. They're, they're never late. They're always neat, they're polite, they're respectful, they're observant, they're sucking in information and knowledge and they're learning all the time. But I always watch that point where in they've gotten used to it. I always watch that transition point where a new volunteer or new staff or somebody new in the Lord, I watch that point where in, hmm, 
they're starting to get into a routine and they're starting to get dull. Is it possible that we always remain on fire? Is it possible that we always sharpen up? Is it possible that we never lose the zeal? Because as Christians, we follow Christ. Can you find a scripture when Jesus just said, you know what, I kind of don't feel like ministering anymore. Can I take a break and you guys do it? You know, he would work so hard, even carry the cross till he was physically unable to do it, that a Roman had to ask Simon of Cyrene to carry it for him for a season. But his, his heart still wanted to. I want to know the, the feeling of when things are loose. You're, you're whacking with your tool, the axe head, and starting to get a little bit loose. Can you feel that? If you're a driver, can you feel your steering's a bit sloppy? Your brakes don't feel like they used to. Can you feel when a relationship has lost its specialness already? Can you feel when your marriage is kind of loose? It's about to fall apart, you know? How to know the feel? Hard to know a feel when things are borrowed, okay? You know and I know when we are loose in the Lord. You can actually tell. Your spirit is a witness. The Holy Spirit in you will actually tell you, you know what? You're not like you used to. You're drying up. And you and I know when we're drying up. You and I know when the zeal is gone, okay? And so, first of all, you know, make sure that your axe is sharp. Secondly, make sure that you're, you're aware when things are getting loose. Thirdly, watch this, verse 6. And so, I'll read from verse 5 so you get the foundation of verse 6. But as one was cutting down a tree, an iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Oh no, master, for it was borrowed. So the man of God said, Where did it fall? Okay. Third point, where did it fall? Can you actually identify a time in your life where that event or that day, or that thing, that offense was where it all started. Can you actually point out when the drying up began, when it started to, to loosen up, and when it actually you actually lost it? Can you tell the day when you had to get up and drag yourself to church? You know you've lost it, but can you tell where did it start? Where did it fall? In fact, when Adam and Eve sinned, God came into the garden. The first question God asked Adam, you know, Adam, where are you? Because he had fallen into sin. Do you know where you are? You know, and so Luke chapter 3 verse 9 reads, And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Remember Pastor Brian's message on that? Okay. See, the axe cuts the tree. We just read a scripture, lay the axe to the root. Roots will bear fruit. When you cut a tree just by its stump, eventually it'll sprout again because there's still roots. Roots will bear fruit. And if you notice anything about fruit, fruits are generally seasonal. There's a mango season, a lanzone season, okay? Uh, there's seasons with fruits, generally. And uh, as a Christian, take this example, for example. We helped a Christian before. This person was so much in debt all the time. And one day came desperately crying, you know, today, today, they're going to cut off my electricity. Please help me. And so just uh, we said, just this one time, we'll help you, okay? But you, you need to do something about this. So we paid for it. They were thankful. Uh, months later, they were back and in debt again. There was a root in this person's stewardship or integrity that kept causing sour fruit to be produced. My point being, if you know where it fell, what was the purpose of the axe in the first place? It was to chop off. The passage of Luke said, lay the axe to the root. I think, and I want to present to you, that some Christians probably cannot grow further 
because seasonally old roots are still there and a new season of fruit that is wrong starts to come forth again. Debt is a particular example. Borrowing money all the time, left and right, it shows a root of poor stewardship or a root of just ignorance and materialism. Next season, you can pay all the person's debt and say, oh, let's just pay it all so that they start fresh. Now, next season, they're in debt again. They showed, they've proven that in studies. People who won the lottery, won millions. Eventually, they all go back into poverty again because they didn't have the character of person to be able to grow and sustain that. The majority of them would lose it. Many overseas workers go abroad, earn so much more than they've ever earned before, buy things, come back, parties with friends and relatives. People start borrowing money from them. And the next thing you know, they're back to zero and they have to grow they have to go abroad again to work. You know what? There's a root in many Christians from the old person that they were, wherein the ax was never laid. Yes, initially, giving our lives to Jesus, it was sharp. We were chopping off sin habits, repenting of things left and right. But you know what? It's important to know where we got dull and when the ax head fell off. Where did it fall? Some roots, if you want to look into things, you can't grow a new you if you still have old roots. And that's why we are to daily, you know, pick up our cross, you know, deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him. There's a, a dying daily to these things. Where did it fall? Or where do you keep falling? There are Christians, Christians, longtime Christians, busy ministers who have roots of anger, temper, moods they can't control. And yet they're Christians. Every once in a while, there's a season wherein they're flaring up again with their moodiness. They're Christians who are trying to grow with good intent, chopping trees down, serving in the ministry, but they fall because of offense, unforgiveness, hurt. They easily get offended. And with that, go to the root. You can't keep building Christian knowledge and service when the foundation hasn't been cut by a sharp ax. There's nothing sharper than the word of God, sharper than any two-edged sword. If our Christianity is hindered because of lust, sexual immorality. Come on, sexual immorality, adultery, uncleanness. Look into that. We can't grow and say, we're gonna have a great year end if we've got roots that are still bearing fruit of our old carnal self every once in a while. There can be inferiority, shame and guilt there are Christians that actually still walk inferior. Your identity is of Christ, not your lack of money or lack of education or how you look. Your, our identity is, is because of Christ. We don't enter heaven because we look good or we have much money or we have achieved much or our complexion is white. You know, We enter heaven by his grace because he's good to us. So our identity is of Christ, but there are Christians who have not gotten over inferiority. And then there are those who's rooted in pride and arrogance, and they feel they're entitled. There are Christians that are still vengeful, revenge. Me, I was so much like that before. I told you this so many times. God continually delivered me from this, that, that I always... If you did something to me, I always had to hit you back harder than how you hit me. It was just an obsession deep within my character. And thank God by his grace, you know, the ax was laid to the root. Gossiping, lying, slandering, misuse of the mouth. Christians do that. So common in Christian churches. Where's the root of that? Pulling people down by talking against them, 
talking behind their backs, getting out of church and talking against a church, this church and that church and this person and that person. The root of that is Lucifer. Lucifer wanted to make his throne where God's throne was. And God cast him down. Now he's pulling down everybody. Satan is doing that. Christians who do that have Lucifer's roots in them. And it hasn't been cut yet. I want us to search into our roots. Don't tolerate it. Don't say, well, I'm really a moody person. I'm really not good with money. I'm really, you know, lazy. I'm really arrogant. I'm really, that's me. Don't, don't accept yourself as you are. Die to that self. Die to self so that we can become alive in Christ. I want us to search deep, sometimes as deep as our childhood. Because those things should have been washed away already. Sometimes even beyond our lives, roots can't be seen, but they can go so deep to the previous generation. Maybe it was from your parents or from your Lolo and Lola or from their Lolo and Lola, but it's a root in, within the clan and it can keep reproducing itself. But Christ came to deliver us and him whom the Son sets free is free indeed and we should be free from that. But you can't lay a life of freedom when there's still a root of bitterness. You cannot, as I cannot, build on old foundations. You must progressively crucify the old you. Deny yourself, Jesus said again. Pick up your cross and daily, it said. Luke, in Luke it said, pick up your cross daily and follow me. In Ephesians, it'll tell you to put off the old man. And then it says to put on the new man. In other words, you can't become a new man if you don't put off don't put off the old man. Okay, and so in verse six again, it says there. You know, where did it fall? Know know the roots of where things fell, and then he showed in the place. And so he cut a stick. This is Elisha, the man of God. Cut a stick. He cut off a stick and he threw it there, and he made the iron axe head float. Amazing. All right. Number one, sharpen your axe. Number two, know the feel of when something's loose. Number three, know where it fell. Know where the source was. And number four, for change to happen, you need a miracle. This was a miracle. The man throws a stick in the water. The iron head, axe head floated. Excuse me. Solid iron doesn't float. That's a miracle. Okay. He threw a stick. And the iron axe head floated. Well, we can't do that. God can. I want to tell you, whatever it is that we have lost, God can do a miracle to restore it. God can make us a new person. When you look at this, he throws a stick into the water. Why couldn't he just point at it? Why didn't he spit at it? Why didn't he throw a stone? He threw a stick into the water and a miracle happened. Something that was buried became, uh, rose up to the surface. The last time I remember when wood redeemed something lost was at the cross. I remember how God had thrown a stick onto Calvary and his own son died there and raised him from the dead. We borrowed Jesus from heaven to earth. For a season, we had him for a while, but we did not take care of him. We, did, we abused him. We maligned him. We nailed him to the cross. We killed him. And God threw a piece of wood on Calvary, and there he was nailed. But the Spirit of God raised him up from the dead, the Bible says. And that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead can also raise you and I up by that same Spirit. An amazing thing happened. A miracle happened. He throws a stick and what was lost was redeemed. What was dead was resurrected. And I want to tell you that God is able to raise us up to be the original person he intended us to be, but was lost by sin. And 
failure. The good news is whatever was lost, God can raise again. And so we borrowed Jesus. We didn't take care of Jesus. We lost Jesus to, to, to death and the tomb, but God raised him up again. How? By a miracle of throwing a stick down. Only God, they said, this is not my saying, I've read it somewhere. Only God can build a bridge between heaven and earth with two pieces of wood. Amazing. Only God can do that. God can. Okay. And so this miracle happened. I think a lot of times the person that God wants us to be, we don't become. We try to follow Jesus, but we fail. And we keep repeating old failures. And we call it repetitive sin. It's a habit that we have from our old past. And I think the reason why we are to lay down, crucify, deny ourselves daily and be crucified daily to pick up our cross is I think there are roots that still need to continually be chopped. Yes, we are saved, but we are being saved and we shall be saved. And that's why we work out our salvation. I think there are old things about me that needs to be cut off. Old habits, old ways, old thinking, okay? <clears throat> Number five, as it goes on. I love this part. Where did it fall in verse six? He showed in the place in verse six. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there and he made the iron float. Verse seven, all important verse seven. Verse six was the miracle. Verse seven is the work. It says there, therefore he said, pick it up for yourself. And so he reached out his hand, and he took it. Number five. Number four was you need a miracle. That's only God can do. But number five, pick it up for yourself. Continue on the work of the miracle. He raised you from the dead. He made you a new creation. You're born again. The old has passed. You're now a new person, but you've got to pick things up from there. You can't build on old foundations. We must progressively crucify the old you. My old me. Luke chapter 9, I'll read the whole verse for you so you understand it. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, if any man desires to come after me, that's a Christian. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. And those that tried and fell away, they desired to follow him, but they did not deny themselves, nor did they pick up their cross daily. You know what's daily? Keep it sharp. You know, if you were not doing it daily, things will get loose. Eventually, it'll fall off. They can't follow him when things fall off. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22 to 24. Let me read that to you as well. That you put off, in verse 22, put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to deceitful lusts. That's the person that was not saved yet. Put that off. This is Paul talking to Christians in Ephesus. Verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on in verse 24. Put off in verse 22, verse 24. Put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. You know, if it says true righteousness... There must be false righteousness, fake righteousness. And the only way we can follow in true righteousness and true holiness is we put off the old man and put on the new man. You can't put on the old man, excuse me, you can't put on the new man where the old man still is. The old man has to die and the new man can come alive. We want the power of the resurrection but bypassing the crucifixion. You can't. The old man has to die so that the new man can rise. And so where do a lot of Christians dry up? Where do a lot of Christians get tired and need rest? Where do a lot of Christians go back into the world? They got tired because the novelty of the freshness of church and a life in Christ wore away. And all of a sudden, new songs aren't exciting anymore. New revelation isn't exciting anymore. You can see them in all the churches. You know, 
worship teams that play on stage and then they leave to eat while the pastor preaches the word, not this church. You see it in a lot of Christians where in their there's no excitement there anymore. And that's because they've probably been trying to do new man things with the old man, trying to do spiritual things with a physical person. And it just doesn't work that way. And so understand this, that you've got to pick it up yourself. God will do the miracle of rebirth, but you've got to work from that. In other words, it is yes by grace. He saves you and me. But that doesn't mean you and I sit back and wait for him to break through the clouds. That means there's work to be done. Let's take November and December. And in any area where we have the old man still there, our moods, our immoralities, our gossipings, our poor stewardship with finances, our debt, our lying, our, you know, slandering. Let's the, the neglect of the devotions that take all of that laziness there and let's lay an ax to the root not just look like we're doing it you know and recognize I need a miracle from God Lord I need a miracle where did it fall it doesn't really matter where it fell because the man of God will take off a piece of stick and throw it to where it fell I don't care how far you and I may have fallen from the Lord. His hand is not waxed short that it cannot save. We, you can think you are so backslidden, but God is able because God can. So you can change and I can change. I've realized the areas in my life where I changed and unchanged and then got tired of it were the areas wherein there were still a root of the old me. And I need to cut that off. I can't keep learning new things, doing new things, serving God when there's still old roots. I will get tired and I will want rest. And that's why we need a miracle. We already have the miracle. It happened 2,000 years ago. All you and I need to do is refer ourselves to that by faith. And so you can, you can lay the ax to the root. You can sharpen your ax. God can do a miracle and you can pick up yourself. When the Bible says, put off the old man, don't ask God to do it. He means to say, you need to do it. When the, Bi when, when the Bible says, pick it up yourself, don't ask God to pick it up. He's done his part. You and I need to do our part and watch how beautiful life can be when you and God work together. Put off the old man, you can do that. You can put on the new man as well. In closing, change doesn't really happen when it's superficial. In fact, it's tiring when we try to maintain change where in old roots are still there. We all have roots to cut. None of us can sit back and say, oh, I'm so free. There's nothing to cut anymore. No, every once in a while, something will come up again. As long as you and I have this fleshly body, there's some cutting still to do. In fact, the old, the last thing we need to cut is this physical body. It's called death. And death will be swallowed up in sweet victory. Between now and then, we've got work to do. Let's take these last two months, City Church, and let's recognize this lockdown has actually exposed a lot about us. And yet we can say, oh, I wish we were back to the old normal. Maybe we'll never go back to that. Maybe another thing will happen and another and another. And who knows, then the Lord will come. But what we can do, among the outward things that we have no control of, you and I can do something about things on the inside that aren't seen. You know what's not seen? Roots. You can't see generally roots. Now, don't be Cebuano and say, what about orchids? I can see the roots, you know. I mean, generally, roots are hidden, fruits are seen. We love to see, to show fruit. We love to have fruit. But often when the fruit is not sweet, because the root 
is not sweet. We all have roots to cut, but we can't cut with a dull ax. Get back to the first love. Get back to the disciplines of what we used to do. And if we would do that, then the new man will find a new foundation to grow on. Instead of repeating same old mistakes and accepting, but I'm always like this, I've always been like this, don't accept that. Change. That's what Christianity is really all about. That he came to change us so that we can go out and change others. And lastly, pick it up for yourself. Don't be a baby to, to rely on everybody else. And there's some things it's good to ask for help. But generally, pick it up for yourself. But lastly, remember this. Don't ax other people's roots. That's carnal, it's satanic, it's so Lucifer to chop other people down, to go about and fault find and say, this is what's wrong with that, and this is what's wrong with this. Let's not be that kind of Christian. Let's not be that kind of church. In fact, that probably is not a Christian and it's probably not a church. So Father, we surrender ourselves to your searching word. Your word penetrates deep between bone and marrow, rightly dividing truth dividing the soul and the spirit, dividing what is spiritual and fleshly. Your word divides what is old and what is new. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that each one of us would take these last two months of 2020 and believe that you're always the God who leaves the best for last. We're believing, Lord Jesus, that these last two months will somehow make up with so much more that was lost for the previous months of this year. Father, we have wasted time too many so, so often. We become busy with ministry or work, but have not gotten down to chopping off roots. We wanna build a house because what we have is too small for us. We wanna be progressive, we wanna grow. We wanna make sure that we always bring the man of God with us. That man, the son of man, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Because we understand if, if Elijah wasn't there, then the miracle wouldn't have happened. And if Jesus is not with us, no miracle can happen in people's lives. Lord, we want to sharpen our ax. We want to make sure that we're recognized when things are loose. And we also want to make sure that you are the God of miracles. And we will make sure we will work with you. And we will make sure that we will not chop off other people's roots. We will pick it up ourselves. Father, let your people benefit from your word. There's so much life and spirit in your word that people benefit from it. That we don't become cosmetic Christians that only look alive but are really dead on the inside. Make us real Christians. Thank you for your grace that does not judge us, does not condemn us, but gives us this time and strength to be able to bring change into our lives. You've done the miracle. We need to pick it up ourselves. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you next week, and we'll end the year changed. And let's believe goodness can come from this. See you next week.
In the past